The Sculptor's Funeral is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash sculpt. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com slash sculpt. From Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Jason Arkels, and you are attending The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast serving the figurative sculpture community across the globe, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. But I hope you're feeling all right, and I hope you're nice and warm as the autumn slowly turns towards the winter these days. So, one of the motivations I've always had for studying and reading about the history of sculpture is this question, how did we get from there to here? When I read Vasari or Cellini, I I read about a, a world very different from my own experience, how the field of sculpture used to be dominated by work for the church and for rich, enlightened patrons. I read about the achievements of the the great Renaissance masters, to which I can barely relate, living as I do in a time quite remote from then. And for me, some of the most fascinating discoveries I make are the instances when I can recognize a shift from one way of doing things into something that has more in common with how I practice sculpture today. It's like the evolution of the use of uh, the clay model in, in the carving of marble statuary or the development of the use of living models, or the development of anatomical study. It must be similar to the way that an archaeologist feels when he finds a missing link in the evolution of a species. Not quite monkey, not quite man, but something in between that might provide insight into our own development. The Mannerist sculptor known as John Bologna is a gold mine of missing links in art history. We, we call him a Mannerist due to his living in the generation after Michelangelo and because of the clear influence he received from him. Yet he is no Baccio Bandinelli or Bartolomeo Aminati. John Bologna has a talent and a personal style that transcends mere imitation of Michelangelo. And yet, John Bologna isn't quite a Baroque sculptor either. Certainly there are elements of that style of sculpture, which would dominate Europe for over a century. Uh, that style is present in the work of John Bologna to some extent. In fact, core elements of the Baroque style were prototypical in his work, which was later developed by John Lorenzo Bernini. Without John Bologna, I think Bernini's work and perhaps the entire flavor of the Baroque would be different than it is. But John Bologna's position as the link between the Renaissance and the Baroque is only one way in which this artist provided an evolutionary step towards the time in which we live. It's during the career of John Bologna that we see the development of a true art market, one that we today would recognize as being similar to the one we know. During John Bologna's career, we see sculpture move from the public piazza to the private collection. We see the dawn of the practice of producing works in editions, or multiple copies of the same work, usually in bronze, to meet a growing demand from a growing clientele. No longer was sculpture limited to the Medici, or the popes, or the cardinals. Art for the first time could be purchased ready-made, not commissioned, by a small elite of private citizens through dealers. And during the same period, we see the Florentine Renaissance move out of Florence, and not just to Rome, but all over Europe, thanks to the dissemination of these small bronze editions that were churned out in Florence by the dozen, and given as gifts to visiting dignitaries by the rulers of Florence, or sent abroad as presents and tokens of political alliance. Much in the way that American music and film spread American influence during the 20th century throughout the world, the Grand Dukes of Tuscany hoped to achieve influence abroad by exporting examples of the city's most famous product, which was art. But for that to happen, Florence needed a different kind of sculptor. The Renaissance model of the lone genius toiling away in solitude, or with the help of a few trusted apprentices, it just wasn't going to meet the demands of the Grand Dukes of Tuscany. Nor would the arrogance and preciousness that seems to have been endemic in the sculptor's studios of the time. There was no use in telling a Michelangelo or a Cellini to, to hurry up with their work, or to efficiently manage a shop full of specialists who could churn out reproductions. 
But John Bologna was just the man for the job. He would get the work done on time and on budget, always with a smile. No matter if you were looking for a sculpture of a Greek myth on a monumental scale, or a small, decorative, meaningless trinket of a figure to add a touch of class to your drawing room. In many ways, he was the opposite of Michelangelo. He had little interest in theology or philosophy, like Michelangelo did, and almost none of John Bologna's work could be characterized as having much intellectual content. But what he lacked in depth, he made up for in virtuosity. He could carve circles around any sculptor alive in Florence, and his sense of design and sculptural composition was more developed than anyone who had come before him. Once again, we find Florence to be the stage for the right sculptor at the right time. But John Bologna was not born in Florence, nor was he from Bologna, as many presume due to his name. Giovanni Bologna, or John Bologna, is actually the Italianization of his real name, which is Jean Bologna. But he wasn't actually from Boulogne in France, either. He was from Flanders, in what is now Belgium, and his native language was French. He was born in 1529, and he was apprenticed to a Flemish sculptor for seven years in his youth. And after that time, Jean Boulogne journeyed south, working as a, as a journeyman sculptor, in order to broaden his experience and training. All roads lead to Rome, so they say, and that's where we find Jean Boulogne in 1550, at the age of 21. Now, to put his age and his place into context, in 1550, Michelangelo had been in Rome for years and was now an old man. It was the year Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Artist was published for the first time, and so that means it's also about three years before Michelangelo would commission a second, grander biography of himself. Even so, Michelangelo's legacy was already apparent. In Florence, the younger generation of Mannerist sculptors, which included Benvenuto Cellini, Bartolomeo Amanati, and Baccio Bandinelli, they were in their middle age. And most certainly, the 21-year-old Jean Boulogne would have been another great admirer of Michelangelo's achievements. In his old age, Jean Bologna repeated the story of actually meeting Michelangelo in Rome and bringing to him a clay or maybe wax model that he had made in order to hear what the divine Michelangelo thought about it. Imagine that, getting a crit from Michelangelo. But the meeting didn't go as well as one might have hoped. Michelangelo took the model in his hands, and he squished it up, and in a few moments remodeled it into a much more vigorous composition, and handed it back to John Bologna, telling him that he needs to learn to model a sketch before he tries to finish it. Now what did Michelangelo mean by that? He needed to learn to model before he learned to finish. Well, he was apparently referring to the habit of overmodeling a work with needless detail and fine surfaces without giving enough attention to volumes and proportions, which are the foundations of sculpture composition. If we are to go on the work of Giambologna's Flemish master, de Bruck, uh, Giambologna may certainly have been guilty of this tendency, and it would have been typical of Flemish sculpture and painting at the time to have a finely rendered and detailed surface, but little vitality in volume and form. Now, this was a lesson that John Bologna seems to have taken to heart, whether or not the meeting actually occurred with Michelangelo. John Bologna was in Rome for two years, and according to both his own accounts and according to the many clay sketches he left in the hands of collectors, he copied and modeled everything he saw in Rome. Rome became his finishing school, and the ancient statues were his masters. Now, this is an important distinction to raise when talking about John Bologna versus other Mannerist sculptors, because in Florence, everyone was working in emulation of Michelangelo, and there were plenty of examples of Michelangelo's work around to learn from. But the foreigner from the north, John Bologna, he was in Rome copying the same masters that Michelangelo himself had learned from as well as Michelangelo's Roman works like the tomb of Pope Julius with the powerful figure of Moses, and, the, and of course the magnificent ceiling of the Sistine Chapel built by Pope Sixtus. But mostly, it was the work of the ancients that attracted John Bologna's attention. Of course, in 1550, there were a lot more Greek and Roman work out there to be seen than had been available to Michelangelo during his first trip to Rome 50 years previously. By 1550, masterpieces of complexity, such as the Leacun or the Laoconte, had been unearthed and restored. The so-called Farnese Bull, 
the largest and most complex antique work ever recovered, had been discovered only four years before John Bologna's arrival. The Farnese Bull is a life-sized figure group containing five figures and a rearing bull. It's a Hellenistic work, which is worlds away from the calm poise and balance of earlier known works which so influenced previous generations of Florentines. Now, John Bologna fell under the spell of these new poses and intricacies of composition, the way Michelangelo had under the spell of the Laocoon when it was first discovered in 1504, which had paved the way for Michelangelo's writhing, muscular forms on the Sistine ceiling. So John Bologna stopped off in Florence on his way back to Flanders, and due to an encouraging and supportive Florentine patron he had met in Rome, he decided to stay in Florence. You might be able to imagine what sort of reception he received from the proud, arrogant little group of sculptors in Florence at the time, who were busy fighting amongst themselves for the title of successor to Michelangelo. They had little time for a young foreigner. And besides, with only his collection of small models of wax and terracotta, John Bologna had no work to show that he was a proven talent beyond a competent modeler. Nevertheless, John Bologna hung on in Florence, supported by his patron, who also introduced him to Francesco Medici, who seemed to like John Bologna. His first commission didn't come until he had been in Florence for over five years, and it was merely just a, a coat of arms in stone used to decorate a palazzo. Now, his big break didn't come until he was 30 years old, when he was allowed to compete with other Florentine sculptors for the commission of a new fountain to go in the main piazza of Florence, the Piazza Signoria, which had already held work by Michelangelo, Donatello, Baccio Bandinelli, and most recently the Perseus by Cellini. It was less than 10 years old at the time. Now, the theme of the public water fountain was to be of Neptune. According to contemporary sources, Giambologna did a great job on the design, and everyone liked it, and maybe it actually did deserve to win, but probably due to the fact that he was a foreigner and still untested in work on a large scale, he didn't get the commission. The commission originally went to Baccio Bandinelli, but he died soon after he was awarded the work, and so the commission went to Bartolomeo Amenati. And now Florence is stuck with this enormous fountain of Neptune, which the Florentines refer to as Il Biancone, or the big white guy. It's, it's not a bad fountain. It's just not a great fountain either, at least in my opinion. It, there are some idiosyncratic bronze nymphs and satyrs, which sort of cavort around the perimeter of the fountain, which are probably the most interesting part, simply because they're, they're kind of grotesque. But the main figure, the towering form of Neptune in marble, is entirely uninteresting. In any event, John Bologna had reached the tipping point in terms of reputation due to his admirable competition submission, and the work started rolling in from that time onwards. Now, the Neptune fountain was erected as part of a years-long plan to celebrate the eventual wedding of Francesco de' Medici, who was the son of Cosimo I, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Now remember, Cosimo was a patron of Cellini, as well as Baccio Bandinelli. Now Cosimo's son, Francesco, was a little younger than John Bologna, and the two of them seemed to get on pretty well. Francesco himself was actually the one who enabled John Bologna to compete for the Neptune Fountain in the first place. And after John Bologna lost, Francesco commissioned John Bologna's first major figure group, maybe as a way of a consolation prize. And that first figure group is called Samson Slaying a Philistine. It's a dynamic and energetic group that amply illustrated John Bologna's position as the rising star in Florence. And he was recognized outside of Florence as well. And in 1562, John Bologna was commissioned by the city of Bologna for a Neptune fountain of their own. Now, this fountain's success is recorded by Giorgio Vasari, who at that time was editing the second and final version of his famous work, The Lives of the Artists, and Vasari actually chose to include a brief mention of this young new sculptor, John Bologna, as an up-and-comer. And while in Bologna, John Bologna also sculpts a figure to decorate the top of a marble column in a courtyard. This seemingly unimportant commission ended up becoming one of the most famous statues of all time. John Bologna's Flying Mercury. And it's a statue of the messenger god in bronze, the entire weight of the figure balanced just on a few toes of one foot, 
arms and legs outstretched. If you don't think you know this one, well, yeah, you totally actually do. Go to the image gallery at thesculptorsfuneral.com and you'll see it. You'll recognize it. Lots of different um, companies and organizations uh, have used the image of the of John Bologna's Mercury as a logo. Uh, everything from florists to post offices. You know, it's the messenger god. So uh, it's it's a very very popular, a very a recognizable form, and it has been since John Bologna's lifetime. But how did this work become so popular? Right? Sure, it was a very innovative and daring design for a statue at the time, but its popularity really spread due to it being the earliest example of John Bologna's work being made in multiple editions. Vasari himself records that a copy of the Mercury was sent to Francesco de' Medici's soon-to-be brother-in-law, the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian. So many copies and even different scale versions were made and made available during John Bologna's lifetime that no one today is actually even sure which is the original. So let's look at this phenomenon a little closer, this idea of the small bronze statuette, known in Italian as a bronzetto. Now, bronzetti were not new with John Bologna. Small household statuettes were very popular in Greece and Rome back in the old days. But during the Middle Ages, demand for this sort of work was basically nil. If you were spending the money to have something cast, it was going to be something useful like bells or lamps, or, or it was going to be a devotional object like a crucifix. Now, once Florence started to rise as a center for bronze casting, thanks in largely, largely due to the efforts of Lorenzo Ghiberti and Donatello in the 15th century, uh, once Florence started to rise as a center, both artists and patrons became interested in the revival of this genre of the bronzetto. An early example was made by Palewolo. It's uh, Hercules and Antaeus. And it's pretty great. It shows Hercules sort of picking up this other guy off the ground in a big bear hug, while Antaeus, the other guy, is struggling to free himself. And it's exactly the kind of sculpture that is perfect for a small-scale bronze. It's a very dynamic composition, and a dynamic composition like that really can't be done in marble on a large scale. You know, and it would be too delicate to do in marble on a small scale. So the freedom of execution these small bronzes afforded the sculptor, along with its relatively low cost, made them a pretty popular genre. And it's these small bronzes that gave rise to the very idea of being a private art collector. Now, before Bronzetti, collecting sculpture just really wasn't a thing. And of course, what made the Bronzetto popular then, the freedom of composition and low cost, are exactly what has made the Bronzetto the dominant genre for figurative sculptors today. I mean, I don't have any stats on this or anything, but it certainly seems, from my point of view, that the majority of figure sculptors today, at least the ones I know, make their living precisely on small-scale bronzes for those who collect them. So in the 1500s, we see the rulers of Florence regularly commission these bronzetti, and the admiration, not to say envy, of other rulers from Rome to France to Austria meant that Florence's bronze sculptors had steady work. But it was with John Bologna's work, starting with the Mercury, that Florentine bronzetti became a popular way for the Grand Dukes of Tuscany to spread their influence and status throughout Europe, right? They would gift these bronzetti to current and potential allies. It was through these bronzetti that the High Renaissance aesthetic was disseminated throughout Europe, and this had the effect of making John Bologna the most famous and influential sculpture on the continent at the time. But that reputation was to come gradually, and we're, we're getting ahead of, our, ahead of ourselves here in the story. So back to the story. Now, the copy of Mercury that was given to the Holy Roman Emperor was one of a series of gestures leading up to this anticipated wedding of Francesco I to the sister of the emperor, Joanna of Austria. The wedding took place, finally, in 1565, but preparations were started many years before this, preparations which included the commissioning of many sculptures, large and small, permanent and temporary. Now, one such temporary work was to be an allegorical figure uh, well, an allegorical figure group, actually, celebrating the victory of Florence over its maritime rival city, Pisa. Right, so the idea was that uh, it would just be done in clay. 
right, as a temporary sculpture. And the design was supposed to match another already existing allegorical statue in marble. So the, these pair of uh, statues would then be placed on either side of the processional route of Joanna of Austria's official entry into Florence for the wedding. Oh, and by the way, that marble statue that John Bologna's clay one had to match was none other than Michelangelo's Genius of Victory, which is now located in, in the Florence Town Hall. Now, John Bologna admirably matched the pose and the gesture of Michelangelo's design, and this clay work was fortunately um, well-received enough that Francesca I eventually commissioned a marble copy a few years later. Now, we need to stop and consider this work of John Bologna's in detail, this this uh, this Florence triumphant over Pisa, because it is a very, very, very significant work in several ways. Uh, as I mentioned, the statue is entitled Florence Triumphant Over Pisa, and it is of a sculptural genre type known as a victory group. So sculptural groups of this type are so named because the first sculpture to fully exploit this particular compositional theme was, in fact, Michelangelo when he sculpted the genius of victory. And so these became known as victory groups. Now, the idea behind victory groups is that they are generally a two-person composition, right, with a dominant and a submissive figure, right? One dominant figure, one, one submissive. Now, usually the dominant figure is above the submissive one. Not always, though. Uh, the victory group and its variations are one of the most effective tools sculptors have to represent drama, struggle, or battle, whether the struggle is a literal one or a metaphorical or an allegorical one. Uh, an additional feature of the victory group is that the submissive figure, right, down at the feet of the victor, is an excellent replacement for the artifices a sculptor must include in order to sculpt a standing figure in marble, right? So basically, we know that the, the human form is not structurally stable when rendered in stone or marble, right? The ankles of the figure are just too thin to support the mass of the torso above. Accordingly, sculptors add elements to their work that can act as supports. For instance, there's a small tree trunk behind one leg of Michelangelo's David. You got tree trunks, you got drapery, columns, urns. These are all typical versions of this idea of a third leg which supports a marble figure. But in a victory group, the lower figure of the group, right, the, the submissive figure, that figure becomes the third leg for the standing figure, all right? So that means that this, this third leg is now an integral element of the sculpture. No artifice is necessary. Florence Triumphant over Pisa shows the allegorical figure of Florence, an ideal female, forcing a male figure representing Pisa to his knees by, well, more or less sitting on him. It's, it's, a, more, it's a lot more graceful than that sounds. Uh, take a look at, at, the, at the website. But the male figure, uh, the one down representing uh, Pisa, is also sort of bound by a chain, the end of which the female figure holds in one hand. The sculpture that John Bologna modeled in clay to match Michelangelo's victory was not the first victory group to come after the original victory. We can think of Cellini's Perseus, or Baccio Bandinelli's Hercules and Cacus, or even Amenadi's Neptune Fountain, as well as John Bologna's own Samson slaying the Philistine. All these sculptures use the motif of a lower figure which acts as a support for a standing figure. But in having to provide a matched sculpture for the victory, John Bologna is also required to imitate the compositional pose Michelangelo used for the victory. The twisting and spiral nature of the genius of victory is an early example of a compositional type known as la figura serpentinata. Now, la figura serpentinata, or serpentine figure, is a category of pose much like contraposto is, right? Contraposto is much more familiar to us today than la figura serpentinata, but it was the dominant pose type from the early Mannerist period all the way through the Baroque and Rococo periods. So with contraposto, we know that we can achieve a, a varied and interesting form in a figure, right? By placing the weight of the figure on one leg, right? That, that raises the weight-bearing hip. And then the model droops the shoulder on that same side of the torso. The spine sort of develops a graceful, 
S curve, right? That's what contraposto is, this sort of counterpoint of the axis of the hips in counterpoint to the axis of the shoulders on sort of a vertical plane. Now, for la figura serpentinata, the hips and shoulders are also in counterpoint to each other, but on a horizontal axis rather than a vertical one. So basically, imagine a figure whose torso is twisted at the waist, right, to the left, to the right, so that the hips are facing a different direction than the shoulders. And then the head is turned in counterpoint to the shoulders, back to the same direction as the hips. On the image gallery at the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, you will find Michelangelo's victory, as well as John Bologna's Florence Triumphant over Pisa, both of which exhibit La Figura Serpentinata. So check it out if, if my description is a little unclear. Many people credit Michelangelo's development of La Figura Serpentinata to the influence of the discovery of the Greek sculpture that I mentioned before, the Liacun, or Leoconte. Whatever the source, we find that versions of this type of pose litter the Sistine ceiling, which in turn influenced countless Mannerist and early Baroque painters as well as sculptors. Up until John Bologna, the Mannerist sculptors really hadn't exploited the pose so much. Imitators of Michelangelo, such as Aminati and Bandinelli, they tended to focus more on the bulging muscularity of the Moses or the idealism of the David rather than Michelangelo's compositional advances. It was John Bologna, in being required to provide a counterpoint to the genius of victory, who fully explored the idea of the compositional significance of La Figura Serpentinata, and he did this in his Florence Triumphant over Pisa, and in many, many, many works to come. Now last, but certainly not least, this sculpture, Florence Triumphant over Pisa, is noteworthy as being one of the earliest forays into the female nude in sculpture. It kind of sounds hard to believe, right? Because the Renaissance is full of painted nudes. You know, we can go back to Botticelli's Venus uh, or his Three Graces. We can go to Leonardo's Leda um, and just, you know, Eve's all over the place, you know, populating the Florentine Renaissance in painting, but not in sculpture. In sculpture, the female nude barely makes an appearance until this point. Female representations in general uh, in sculpture stuck with Madonnas and, you know, you know the odd Mary Magdalene, uh, which, of course, both are fully covered. Donatello's Judith, for instance, is garbed from head to foot. It's really only on the tombs uh, in San Lorenzo uh, that we encounter Michelangelo's allegorical female nudes, dawn and night, and frankly, looking at those works, you could totally be forgiven for wondering if Michelangelo had ever even seen a naked woman. There's a story that someone asked Michelangelo who he had used as a model for these females, and Michelangelo's silent response was to point to one of his male laborers. Judging from the statues, it doesn't look like he was joking. Now, what lay behind this disregard for the female form were several issues. For much of the 1400s, the church was the main source of commissioned work for sculptors, and so the church had a little call for female nudes apart from, you know, Eve. On the other hand, the patrons of the so-called Florentine Academy, Cosmo the Elder and Lorenzo the Magnificent, they were ardent Platonists and emulated the Platonic opinion that the male nude was the epitome of beauty and order and harmony and grace. Hence the unnecessarily nude Davids, the needlessly nude Perseus by Cellini, the nude Hercules, nude Neptune. The only large-scale female nude I can think of before uh, John Bologna's Florence Triumphant over Pisa is actually the decapitated body of Medusa lying crumpled at the feet of Cellini's Perseus. There are other smaller representations, usually accidental to a larger theme or, or merely decorative, as in the case of you know, the small allegorical figure atop Cellini's famous salt cellar that he made for the King of France. Um, but uh, yeah, the female nude just isn't there. I find it kind of amazing that as intensely as Cellini and the other Mannerists wanted to find a way to best Michelangelo and become the new genius of Florentine sculpture, that none of them turned serious attention to the female form, which Michelangelo hadn't done. So John Bologna rose to fill that niche. It was a time when taste in all things classical and antique had widespread appeal. It was no longer reserved just for the literati of Florence and Rome. 
and even commissions for the church could have a distinctly secular or classical flavor to them. And it's worth noting that John Bologna did not often have religious subjects to work with. He did, you know, some saints, a few Christs, uh, several reliefs with religious themes, and a few altars, and even some chapels, including a chapel he designed for himself and is now buried in. But religious works comprise a small fraction of his total output. John Bologna's patrons were royalty and nobility, the secular well-to-do, as well as the secular-minded aesthetes within the church. But before we continue with the life of John Bologna, I want to quickly mention the sponsor of the podcast, Audible.com. As you know, Audible.com is the leading provider of digital audiobooks on the interwebs with over 150,000 titles to choose from. It's good stuff. I'm actually a listener to audiobooks, and you should be too. We already know that you like podcasts, and audiobooks are a great thing to have in your studio in the background as you sweep the studio or, or make molds or something. Uh, they cut the tedium a bit. At least they do for me. One title that I think you might be interested in uh, is called The Ugly Renaissance, Sex, Greed, Violence, and Depravity in an Age of Beauty. It's by Alexander Lee. Behind the vast explosion of new art and culture in the Renaissance lurked a seamy, vicious world of power politics, perversity, and corruption that is more in common with the present day than anyone dares to admit. So that sounds pretty good, right? Well, you can download that audiobook today or any other audiobook of your choice for free if you go to audibletrial.com slash sculpt and sign up for a free 30-day subscription to Audible's service. The first book is free, like I said, and you can cancel the subscription at any time. And the audiobook is still yours to keep, so you really can't lose. So go to audibletrial.com slash sculpt to sign up. And by using that URL, audibletrial.com slash sculpt, you're letting Audible know that I sent you. And when you do that, Audible helps to support the podcast. So that's audibletrial.com slash sculpt for your free audiobook today. Alrighty, back to the story. So as John Bologna's renown spread, his workshop grew. John Bologna turned out to be a very efficient administrator as well as an excellent teacher, and several of his apprentices became some of the most notable sculptors of the next generation, including Pietro Francavilla, Pietro Tacca, and Adrian de Fries. Many of his employees were specialists in casting or carving or enlarging, and this is one of the first workshops that evolved the nature of art production from a craft or a trade into a real industry. Right? John Bologna was one of the first sculptors who regularly would model his statues in clay or wax and then turn the rest of the work, either casting, firing, or carving, over to his assistants to complete. Now, this workshop churned out massive amounts of statuary of all sorts, from the small bronzes that the Medici were constantly gifting to aristocrats, to architectural decoration in stucco, to large monuments and fountains in bronze and marble. Now, in the early 1580s, when John Bologna was in his early 50s, he completed what many regard to be his masterpiece, The Rape of a Sabine. It's a monumental scaled three-figure victory group, which is located in the Piazza Signoria, the same square that houses the David, the Perseus, and the Neptune Fountain. Now, the Rape of a Sabine is the culmination of a line of inquiry John Bologna pursued that started with his early victory groups 20 years before. Now, I mentioned that John Bologna's work is not intellectually weighty, but don't think that that means that his work is facile. Rather than concerning himself with content, John Bologna's passion was for form itself. Much of his works seem to have been in pursuit of perfection of composition, right? He would produce study after study, many of which survive today as Bronzetti or even just the, the wax models. And in these studies and designs, we see John Bologna altering and refining poses and compositions until he felt he achieved the best possible design for that compositional concept. Now, it didn't matter if one study of the figure portrayed a Venus, and in another iteration of the same pose, it was an allegorical figure of architecture or of music. The identity of the subject was of little interest to him. His interest was just in the form itself. He was designing his work to be seen from any and all angles, and he was determined to chase down the pose that would be beautiful, harmonious, and understandable from every angle. 
right? And he did this with single figure compositions and with double figure composition groups like victory groups. And this line of inquiry led him eventually to the incredibly complex composition of a three figure group. Now it's important to repeat that the statue's genesis was entirely from composition, not from the story of, you know, the actual rape of Asabi, you know, the story of early Rome and its conquest and pillaging of a neighboring tribe known as the Sabines. In fact, when John Bologna was well into the construction of the monument, right? I mean, after he had modeled it, after he had perfected, you know, the composition, when he started carving it in marble, he didn't yet have a title for it. The work was entirely motivated by the form, by the composition, not by the content. It's called The Rape of Asabi only because it's a plausible title for the composition. By the way, uh, in this case, the word rape you know, in the title Rape of a Sabin, it's being used in its original sense, meaning abduction rather than a sexual assault. You know, there's no one being, you know, raped, uh, but someone is being stolen. Anyway, once this theme uh, for his group was settled upon, relief plaques were then sculpted by John Bologna and made for the pedestal on which the statue stands that sort of enlarge upon and reinforce this theme that had been, you know, sort of arbitrarily imposed upon the sculpture. Now, The Rape of Asabin was an instant hit, and it's one of the most famous sculptures of the Renaissance. I mean, it's total eye candy. It's beautiful from every angle, just as it was designed to be. Take a look at it on the website, sculpturesfuneral.com, if you are not familiar with it. I'm sure you are, though. And when you do, when you take a look, notice the orientation of the figures relative to each other. And you will see that John Bologna is cleverly taking this idea of la figura serpentinata, you know, a figure twisting first in one way and then back. He enlarges this concept of that pose through all three figures, right? The low figure faces one way. The center figure twists around to a contrary angle. And then the top figure turns back to align with the low figure. It's la figura serpentinata, but amplified through three figures, the way that a concerto is amplified into a symphony. It's, it's really, really genius. A quick side note, the Rape of Asabin was moved into its position in the Loggia del Lanzi, which is the sort of, you know, porch um, in, the, in the Piazza Signoria. It was moved there before it was completed, right? It was finished in situ and was unveiled in 1583. Now, recently, it has been announced that the work will be relocated to the Uffizi Museum and replaced with a new copy in marble. This is a very common occurrence in Florence, by the way. Most of the historical sculptures have been moved inside into museums for protection and then replaced with fairly exact copies. If we want to keep these sculptures around for future generations, it's just what we have to do. I don't know exactly when they plan to move this enormous sculpture, uh, which hasn't been moved for 430 years. But I plan to be there when it does. It's going to be an amazing sight to see. Now, among all of John Bologna's various works, one stands out as being one of the most original sculptures ever completed. It's known as the Apennine, and it is the crouching figure of a mountain god rising out of the bedrock itself in the middle of one of Francesco Medici's villa gardens. And it is enormous. I mean, it is a colossus. It is constructed out of stone, brick, lava stone, and other masonry, uh, and the figure of the mountain god appears to be the earth itself come to life, with stalactites hanging from its eyebrows and forming its massive beard. I'm sure it's been the inspiration for many a fantasy movie monster. And even though it is so huge, the actual modeling of the figure, uh, it's crazy. It has a sp the spontaneous feel of a rough clay sketch. Now, to give an idea just how big this thing is, you should know that there is a grotto inside the lower torso, like a room you can go hang out in, and then a smaller room above in the upper torso, which has windows uh, that lets the visitor sort of peek out through, you know, underneath the, the giant's beard. He is the granddaddy of all garden gnomes. The fact that Apennine was constructed at the same time John Bologna was carving his Rape of Asabin is a testament to how large and well-organized his workshop was, and how focused and driven the sculptor himself could be, even into his 60s. Now, John Bologna did live to the old age of 79, 
And during his last decade, we see a quite understandable slowing down, but never a halt. He turned his attention to the design and outfitting of the chapel in which he wished to be buried, and also to shoring up his legacy by happily acquiring prestigious titles and coats of arms and things like that. He died in 1608. But his last marble work, finished in the year 1600, is notable, as it not only shows no sign of declining ability, it shows a remarkable virtuosity. It might be one of the best things he ever carved. It is the statue of Hercules slaying a centaur, and it is the final iteration in a long line of scale models and studies John Bologna had carried out in the previous decades. And it is carved perfectly. And it shows a writhing centaur. Let that sink in. A writhing centaur, bent nearly in half by one powerful arm of Hercules, who then raises his club with his other hand, arm in mid-swing. It is a sculpture full of violent action and passion. And it is fitting that this work should be completed and dated with the year 1600, as it has as much to do with the new aesthetic in sculpture that was to arise in the coming decades in Rome as it did with the Florentine Renaissance. This work, among with many of John Bologna's masterpieces, was to become a central source of inspiration for a sculptor who was, at that time, just two years old, John Lorenzo Bernini. The life and career of John Bologna was the necessary link between the Renaissance and the Baroque eras in sculpture. All right, I want to thank you all for listening today. I just want to remind you before I go that you can always support the podcast uh, in so many ways. You can rate and review the show. That's a great way to do it. Go to the iTunes page for The Sculptor's Funeral and tell others why you listen. Tell everyone how good you think it is or, you know, or how bad you think it is. Be honest. Uh, and give the podcast as many stars as you see fit. And if giving the podcast five stars isn't enough, you can always give cold hard cash by clicking the donate button on our website, thesculptorsfuneral.com. You can also check out our sponsor as well, audibletrial.com slash sculpt. And finally, if you or the organization you are associated with would like to become a sponsor of the podcast, which reaches hundreds of figurative sculptors all around the world each week, contact us at thesculptorsfuneral at gmail.com. Find out how you can get your own message out by sponsoring the largest, best, most entertaining, most informative, and only podcast for the figurative and atelier sculptor. Thanks again for listening, everyone. I'll be back soon with more. Thank you.